Welcome to Seattle Voices. I'm Eric Liu. I'm delighted to have as my guest today Nancy Nordhoff, a philanthropist, civic leader, and the founder of Hedgebrook. Uh, Nancy, welcome. Thank you, Eric. Um, I want to talk about all these uh, aspects of your work and your life, but let's start with Hedgebrook, um, which is a uh, retreat center, a writer's retreat center for women. That's correct. Um, and uh, tell me about the vision of this. As we sit here in 2014, this is a 26-year-old institution now. Um, why did you start Hedgebrook? Well, it was an idea. I've bought a piece of land on Whidbey Island to live on. And when I began to explore it, it's, it was 30 acres, um, wandering through the woods, <laughs> trying to find my way in, trying to find my way out. And there were buildings. There was a farmhouse. There was a barn. There was, um, gosh, I guess that was all. Oh, there was a, a workshop. And I said to myself, boy, this is a pretty big piece of property. These are old buildings. I'm all by myself. What the devil am I going to do with this? Um, and for whatever reason, uh, the idea wasn't a vision, wasn't a dream. The idea of this land, this is a nice piece. It's creative. It wants to have something happen on it, hmm. not necessarily to it, but on it. And from that kind of rejection of my first idea of this is a place I might want to live, um, came the idea of, of women's voices. I'm a graduate of Mount Holyoke College which is a, a, a college for women. And I, even after almost, well, it was 40 years at that time out of graduation, I think some of those values kept poking away at me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the idea came, uh, women need that kind of, women need support, um, artists need support. What might we do here that would support women? And if not women doing it, who else would? So out of that came uh, a residential place with six cottages and a, and a house um, for seven women to spend time working. Just an idea. I was fortunate enough to have resources to do it and a commitment to do it, which, you know, many ideas sit on a shelf or in somebody's head mm. and never get done. And I, I think it was meant to be. I, I don't think there was a spirit about it all except maybe the land. You, you, to that very point, there was a the way you worded things just a moment ago was very interesting, which is that the, 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 the piece of land there, it wanted something. It wanted something creative. Um, and that seemed to me to be a very deliberate choice of words on your part, that uh, you were very attuned to um, what that space and what that part of that ecosystem, um, in, in a sense, wanted. You, was that itself, that attunement, something that you've had for a long time, just kind of paying attention to not you know, I'm going to control this and I'm going to create this, but what is the vibe of a place telling me? I don't know where it came from, but that's the only explanation I have. Mm. Um, it's a piece of land that has lots of features to it, uh, pastures and ponds, which we built in a view of Mount Rainier and the Space, Space Needle, um, the sound going south out of Whidbey. Um, you come out of the woods and you walk into the open, and it just, it's a calming. It's, it's just a, a place that has so much feeling to it, at least it did for me. And I thought, by golly, if you're going to work in a cottage all day long, you better come out into the woods or into the, the, the view that supports and uh, protects you. So at Hedgebrook now with the, these living quarters and this kind of common space, describe the kinds of things in any given week or any given month that are happening at Hedgebrook uh, today. Describe that. Wow, you've got six women working, maybe seven. Who knows how they're working? Our whole goal was just to ask them to be the best writer they can be. So we leave them alone during the day. Uh, they take the night before. They take a breakfast basket of food back with them and lunch. So they're all on their own. They can do whatever they wish. Many will go for a walk, take a bike, but most are there. Most of them are are there working. Um, the kind of work that we think we're supporting and want to support is the kind of hard work inside. If you have a story to tell, you know, it may be a personal story. It may be one just racked with emotions. That takes a heck of a lot of digging. It may be a story of part of your life that you've experienced and need to be told. I was trying to think of something I heard this weekend that, oh, I can't come back with it, Eric, but 
everybody has something they want to work on. Mm -hmm. And they may work on it for a while, they may turn to another one, they may finish a piece. But the real difficult work is when you have to dig inside of yourself and risk telling things that perhaps you don't want to tell, but you have to tell to do the writing. So there's that going on in the cottage. There may be some people wandering around outside, enjoying the outside. They come together, we, we combine that solo work, and it is very solo, writing is very solo work, maybe all the creative arts are, um, with a community time around dinner and the, in, down in the farmhouse. So the cottages are scattered a, across the land, not too far apart, they're not really scattered, and you come down to the farmhouse to gather for dinner. Uh, that's a balance. Balance of working hard alone, mm -hmm. balance of coming together to talk about what you've been doing, ask questions, ask for help if you need it. So the day is um, whatever any one of those women want to make it. Is there a typical duration of stay for a, for a writer? We're two weeks to six week possible. Uh, I think the average now is around three, mm -hmm. three and a half. Mm -hmm. We started out much higher than that. Longer stays, three months was the longest. Mm -hmm. People got bored. <laughs> they don't know what to do with themselves after the second month. <laughs> well, there is something, I mean, even the, the, the physical layout and space itself uh, embodies, which is limits are helpful, right? I mean, if, Absolutely. You, have, if, if, you, if you know you've got three <laughs> weeks there um, to do that kind of deep digging and yep. deep excavation you're describing, that can concentrate the mind, yes. right? Yes, mm -hmm. um, correct. And so over these 26 years now that Hedgebrook has become uh, not just this retreat center, but now more broadly, it, it stands almost, the, the word Hedgebrook stands for a community, a whole ecosystem of, of people, of artists and creators. Um, what's changed over time uh, about uh, how it works? Is the, is the core experience essentially as it was, uh, you know, a, a couple of decades ago? Yes, and it's pretty amazing. Our, our values that we started on, the founding principles, uh, are pretty much the same, and those, the two important ones, um, I've been talking about this. We went down with an alumni gathering in San Francisco this week, so I did a little prep. <laughs> um, there's no charge to the women who come, so room and board is provided. They have to get themselves there, uh, so airfare is certainly, and we have many from, from overseas, so that is a commitment. The other one is, is the commitment to diversity, hmm. and that's across the board. But the particular one that I'm very proud of, and it was not, I have to give credit to a good friend of mine who said, Nancy, you must, you must care about women of color and making room for them and do it um, deliberately. So the other kinds of diversity, ethnicity, um, religion, age, geography, um, Oh, anything you want to, we don't want to leave out anybody. It mm -hmm. is not exclusive, inclusive. It, we need to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. And, but the diversity is, is of women of color about 50% and has been that way from the beginning. I'm really proud of that. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful mix of women around the table. You mix African American from this country, Asian Americans, and then overseas people. They don't know each other, except they're all women and they're writers. Mm -hmm. And there they are. Mm -hmm. That universal aspect of right. craft and story finding and storytelling and, starts to connect those yeah, dots. And, and being all women, it's, it's a totally different environment than being a co-ed situation. Well, so I'm really pleased with what the, the, you know, we've had many board members and lots of changes in executive directors, but the core values have stayed the same, which says something to me. Of course, I will admit, Eric, that if somebody starts kicking around a strange idea, <laughs> I speak to them, <laughs> but not often. <laughs> you know, I, I want to just linger a bit longer on the on one aspect of the core, which is, as you say, a space for women. And you know, I mean, Virginia Woolf's phrase, "A room of their own," right? right I mean, the, the, right. This, this this idea that it matters um, that it matters in society in general, that it matters in particular for artists. Um, you, you said you were. Forty years on, you were still being poked by the values that uh, Mount Holyoke College had instilled in you. D describe those values. Describe the ways in which that um, single-sex educational experience had, had shaped you. Well, I can't do it as articulately as many, but I don't know where else that idea came from. And um, part of our part of Mount Holyoke's um, 
mission is to educate um, young women and to, to be leaders in the world. Um, and I, you know, some women, I mean, look at the young group of women now who are taking leadership positions coming out of early business careers and having some, some affluence. Um, our generation, I think, had to go to college, had to come back, had to start a family, had to do all those kinds of things until at some point you're really freed up to figure out what it is you want to do as a woman, in, in my case, at age 50, and that was the breaking point for me. You, you uh, took a cross-country drive. That, I did. That... I did do that, yes, a couple times, which was great fun. Uh, but it was a changing time in my life. Uh, I'd, I'd been in uh, Seattle boards as volunteers and whatnot for 20 years, and I had burned out, and I knew it. It was easy, easy to tell. So I had bought a van and uh, started driving. It didn't take too long, just, you know, just thinking. But came back from that and then had an opportunity to think, what would I do if I had the ability to just be creative with my life? Hmm. And Hedgebrook is what came. Hmm. I have no explanation for that other than it was the right time, right place. What impelled you getting in that van in the first place, though, that feel, I mean, yes, you said you felt burned out and, and the rest, but plenty of people reach a point in midlife where they're, they, they know that what has come before isn't quite working anymore, but they don't, but re relatively few people will get in a van, destination unknown, start going, and then start reflecting on how do I make something creative out of the, the rest of my life? What, what, what do you think sparked that? Well, I like to drive. <laughs> and how do you mind driving alone? And I'd driven across the country a couple of times. And it was just an adventure. Um, I was either alone or I had had a friend with me, but not all the time. But it was, it was the freedom of the road, because you can't do that now. A woman can't, I don't think, a woman can take off and do what I did. I mean, I would drive until I came to a rest stop or the end of the road, which I wouldn't do now. Hmm. But it was, uh, it was freedom. It was a, a change of pace from home. A little selfish, because I left I left my husband, a kid's father, with, uh, I guess, just one daughter at the time. Um, but I, I, I did it. That's all I can say. It, it was a selfish act, but it, it's turned out, I think, where we're all in pretty good shape. I, I'm curious on, on this. I mean, the act of creativity, uh, oftentimes, you were alluding earlier to, you know, many creative acts at a certain core are solo acts, um, mm. and, and to to be generative often uh, in creating something, whether artistic or in business as an entrepreneur or in politics, whatever the field may be, a certain amount of selfishness is required, right? A certain amount of both ego sure. and I I'm gonna focus on this or me or what this is. Um, what, what kinds of conversations unfold at Hedgebrook about what the right balance is to strike between um, being quote unquote selfish and and you know pursuing your vision of what you should be, um, and the larger weave of obligations that everybody has. Um, uh, Are you talking uh, about conversations coming from the group of women? Yeah. Well, I think they do just exactly what you said. Um, it's a it's a difficult balance depending upon whether you're holding a job full time, whether you have a family, what your obligations are. One of the, the probably the strongest thing that that happens while a woman is there. And many do come as, as published uh, authors. But those who don't often leave by saying, I am a writer. Hmm. There was a story I heard last week where a woman was, came, we took her to her cottage and then came on back down to see the farmhouse. And whoever was bringing her, one of the staff members, said, this is where the writers eat dinner. And she said, well, where do I eat? Uh, a couple of days later, she was able to admit she too was a writer. But many, when they leave, um, they can say that and they can say it with you know, good conviction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that story of self, uh, you know, I, I want to just return to even prior to Mount Holyoke College for you. You are part of a, a, a prominent and civically and philanthropically active uh, uh, family here in the Seattle area. Um, growing up uh, here. Did you have a sense of, uh, here's what you're expected to be, Nancy, here's what, you know, you, you are 
the kind of life you're to have, is that what had gotten you, gotten you in the first place on this whole treadmill of doing tons of boards and volunteering and the rest? And oh, what, what was that story in kind of those first chapters of what Nancy's supposed to be? Oh, I think you're right. I think that's what it was. Um, you grow up in a family in which you see good things being done. I don't think I was ever told what to do, but it was implicit. Um, and I guess I did it. It wasn't an awful lot. It was something you did. So that that was after college. I came back uh, to Seattle and uh, had a couple, couple of years on my own. One thing that wasn't uh, I didn't put in that bio was that I learned how to fly an airplane mm -hmm. after college. And I think I chose flying because my brother was into racehorses and roses and my sister was into hunter jumpers and they had their things and I wanted my thing. I don't know why I did that. A couple years before uh, that was over, but it was it was fun. I had a trip to Little Rock, Arkansas, for a wedding. Uh, went up to Calgary and chewed toothpicks in the airplane as I went over the Rockies because I was nervous as heck. <laughs> so that was probably the most adventurous part of my life. The rest of it, I, I stayed pretty true to the line mm -hmm. until Hedgebrook came along. The the uh, uh, though stay with that though I mean e even then having that instinct to literally want to take flight uh, and perhaps metaphorically too to to take some flight sure. um, at what point w was there a point prior to that you know reaching age fifty and deciding to go on the road and 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 have a major change in life direction if you if you think back to the years prior to that were you already wanting to change the story of uh, your own journey and your own uh, arc. No. No. You know, there, there are things and people who influence you. Um, I can't think of anybody who said anything to me about airplanes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I did that. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as far as Hedgebrook, there were influences that, I, as I described, came together. Um, no, and, and after that started, I was pretty busy. No more ideas. I don't want any more ideas here. <laughs> it's pretty good to have one killer idea <laughs> in one's life and to really yes, uh, plow, plow oneself into it. Yeah. Do, do you call, do you think of yourself as an artist of a certain kind, having envisioned mm. and created this institution? Well, I don't think just from this. Um, I think everybody is creative. I think we all have creative instincts within us. We don't all have the ability or the time or the circumstances to pull them out. Um, <laughs> I went to St. Nicholas School. Remember where St. Nicholas was? It's next to St. Mark's and then became part of Lakeside. But our sophomore year, our junior year, there were only 11 of us in the class. And I was an athlete. And I spent most of my time creating lineups for my 10 other classmates mates to play volleyball. Crazy. Uh, one creative thing, and, and we won every game we played in that college, for, in that high school for four years except mm -hmm. one game. So something was working there. Mm -hmm. um, I, like to, I like to design areas in the garden. I, I love people coming around the table, men and women, to do a job and what can come out of that create that creativity of minds and experiences? I just I flourish on that. Hmm. So yes, um, those were the kinds of things I was doing in the community until I finished that part and went the other way. Do you uh, you you perhaps overstate the way in which you finished that part? Uh, certainly in the Whidbey. Island community where you reside now, you've remained very active just as a citizen, um, involved in different uh, things. And even here in Seattle, you're one of a small group of women who a number of years ago founded mm -hmm. Seattle City Club. Correct. Right? Yep. Um, and so that aspect of your life is just a, a, a creative force in civic life, even apart from actual artistic life, um, appears to remain uh, part of your, your DNA. Well, I resist it if I can. <laughs> It's enough at this age, Eric, to, uh, you know, really do a lot of reading, which I never did before, and, and uh, that seems to be a natural thing to do now. Uh, so I have a generational question and then a gender question for you. The generational question is, 
having now gone through this uh, th this path that you've taken that has led you over these last couple of decades to to Hedgebrook, um, what advice do you have for <laughs> younger women today? Uh, you know, maybe they're women of the age that you were at when you were about to get on that cross-country drive, or maybe they're even younger than that. Um, what advice do you want to pass on when you think about what you've learned from the way your journey unfolded? Oh, that's a tough question. I had that coming from the Seattle Storm event a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, I do better, I think, if someone comes to me and says, Nancy, can you help? And more than casual conversation with somebody and saying, oh, why don't you do this? I mean, that can be pretty simple, but mentoring, mentoring is a very serious kind of, of activity. And I know a fair amount about raising money and about giving money, and I'm happy, always happy to talk about that with somebody and hope it helps, whether they're an agency person, a development officer, or whether they're looking at becoming a major donor. Um, so that's a mentoring mm -hmm. of sorts. Who have been I, some of your own mentors that you think of as having been particularly formative? I think just the people I watch. Uh, I don't know where the ability to, to uh, want to give money away came from. I mean, you know, we all do it to some degree, but, but it becomes a, a very, um, well, it's an activity that really stretches somebody. It's all about building relationships and getting to know people in the enjoyment of, of offering somebody the opportunity to help a not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. I, I get a great deal of pleasure from that. Um, I don't know. The, the gender question that I wanted to pose uh, next to the generational one is, you know, as I hear you describe Hedgebrook, um, you know, there's a part of me as somebody who writes uh, myself mm -hmm. who, uh, who just says, hey, can I come play? I, I want to play, right? And uh, it sounds like such a great vision to create this uh, quiet retreat space and this, uh, this spirit that you've described. Um, what do you say to um, men uh, who want in some way to be involved, who see the magic that you've created um, and do, do you say, that's create easy, your own Hedgebrook? That's an own? easy one. No, yeah. I say, come participate with us and, and help your, your daughters and your nieces and give us some money. Uh -huh. But, you know, men have, there are hundreds of artist colonies around this country and the world. And those, for the most part, gee, 99% are co-ed. Mm. And I'll bet you that the proportion of men to women in those go to the men's side. Mm. So find your own place to go. And if you want your own single sex retreat, make it. Do you, um, as you have been so involved in the life of Hedgebrook, what's changed in you? Just your own worldview or how you do things? Uh, what's, what's evolved? Well, I, I can remember a family meeting that we had talking about um, how the family can I make a philanthropic gift to the community. <clears throat> and the question came to me, and I said something like, well, I don't know what my life work has been. And Grace, the older daughter, the wise, wise one, said, Mother Hedgebrook, Hedgebrook was what, is what your life has given you, is what you have done. So I think that was true. Um, it's... It's not easy for me to take credit for Hedgebrook now. I can take credit for building it, for investing in that. But the strength of Hedgebrook are the women that are working there and the women who have been there and go out into the world. Mm. And I'm a bystander. Mm. Um, yes, I'm a founder, and yes, it's really nice to be said, hooray, hooray, hooray for Nancy. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not doing a thing now except what I can do to help. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not, but it's a... It's a, it's a wonderful role to be able to play, to be a founder, and to have something so doggone successful, you know? We went through some rough times, but we came out of them, as all not-for-profits do, I think. It's sort of like you go through your teenage years and then into young adulthood, and now at 26 years, we've, we look pretty good. Mm -hmm. Moving into the world with a, a national board, gathering more people from around the world, and doing some very fine publications. Have you inspired the creation of other Hedgebrook-like institutions? Yes, yes. They haven't all stayed in business, though. Hmm. 
Soapstone was a small uh, two-women uh, facility down out west of Portland, and they've had to to step away from that and sell the property. So it's a it's a continual fundraising job, uh, and you need good people to do that. And fortunately, we have that at the moment. Hmm. You know the the community of people now over 26 years. How how often do you have? reunions or a chance for people who are part of this. You were describing earlier, 1,500 mm -hmm. uh, women who've, who've uh, participated in the work of Hedgebrook. How often do they get to meet each other? Well, at, at Hedgebrook itself, we've had two reunions. One was at year five, and then last year at year, at year 25. And that year, last year, was, was dedicated just to having alums return to, as writers in the cottages. But then we did have a reunion for a weekend. Hmm. And I don't remember how many came, but there were tents out, set out, and people stayed on the island. And uh, it was a good gathering. Um, what was part of that question? Around the, uh, part of our mission is not only the retreat center there on Whidbey, where we have women in residence, but it's to support those women as they go into the world. Mm -hmm. So there are gatherings of alums in cities that they call themselves together. San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York are the biggest. So they, they're very supportive. In Brooklyn, there is a uh, facility called um, Hedgebrook, well, Brook, Hedgebrook, Brooklyn, Grace, where are you? Um, <laughs> done by two, by, by an alum of Hedgebrook where they have a, a writing retreat, a, a civic, you know, a, mm -hmm. a center to come and rent a table and write. So that's, they're not all alums, but they gather around a, a make fire like, and they have food and they have desks and they talk. So that's a Hedgebrook event there. Um, but people are very supportive of each other. Well, it's a very powerful yes, it is. vision, uh, and you know, I, I I appreciate the way in which you say, without false humility, that though you started it, you are a bystander now. That you've created something where the ecosystem has taken life of its own, and um, yep. and there's tremendous uh, power and promise in it. Uh, Nancy Nordhoff, thank you for joining us today. Did it go that quickly? Eric? It sure did. Uh, <laughs> All right, thanks sure. very thank much you for very this much. conversation. <laughs> yes. My guest today has been Nancy Nordhoff, philanthropist, founder of Hedgebrook. Uh, and civic leader in our region. You've been watching Seattle Voices. I'm Eric Liu. Thanks for joining us and tune in again.